I'm Kara Ray, founder of The Powerful and Uncensored Entrepreneurs. I'm a mother, stepmother to three beautiful children. I'm a wife and a proud entrepreneur. I'm a mindset coach specifically for the powerful and ambitious online female entrepreneurs who desire to create wealth and abundance in all areas of their life. The Powerful and Uncensored Mompreneur Podcast is for the ambitious women and mothers who are ready to rise together and empower one another. Get plugged in each week for unfiltered and uncensored conversations between myself and industry leaders who are here to support you. They have unwavering points of views and empower women to believe in themselves. We will be discussing business, spirituality, sexuality, energy, strong points of views, manifestation, and what I like to call breaking the stigma topics, conversations that will no longer be silenced. This is a safe place to reclaim your power of being a woman. Let's dive in. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Powerful and Uncensored Mompreneur Podcast. Today, I have Stephanie Cherma on the podcast, and this is incredibly exciting. This conversation is going to be amazing. It's going to blow your minds, but I just want to give you guys a little background about Stephanie, and then she'll come on and say, hey, hey. So (laughs) Stephanie is a relationship expert and mentor, and she's also the CEO and founder of The Good Love Company. If you haven't heard about it, you should look it up and go check it out. So her mission is to show the world that love is the answer and help women and couples to reclaim their self-love starting with themselves. So welcome, welcome, Stephanie. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited to have you here. I love that we were able to just, you know, chat a little bit before this, get to know one another a little bit more. That was nice. Yeah. Honestly, it's it's nice to be able to just come on and have a conversation that's just free flowing and not difficult. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's nice when it's just, hey, how are you? And talk about our kids, yeah. life, you know. Yeah, no, it's, but that's how it's supposed to be. We spend so much time stressing and business and it's nice to just chat with girlfriends. Oh my goodness. Tell me about it. This week has, has it has been a week. I told Autumn, <laughs> I was like, it has been a hot minute. <laughs> like, it has been a hot minute. But uh, so I always love to start my conversations by asking this one question, everybody, but what is something that you're currently celebrating in your life right now? Ooh, I love that question. I'm actually, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that synchronicity is hilarious because I was actually talking to my mentor and a very, very dear friend of mine. And we were talking about the notion of personal responsibility and being able to sort of zoom out and see things that could be perceived as agitating or annoying and then sort of reframing it as, as a gift of what would the woman that I'm, I'm working towards and, and stepping into do, how would she behave? So today I, I had a long list of life adult things to do, like a doctor's appointments. I have to get passport photos done. There were forms to fill out. I have to call the government. I have to call my accountant. Just stuff that comes with the decision to live this big, bold, amazing life. And I was kind of joking, thinking like how a few years ago I would have avoided it, resented it. Oh God, another annoying thing to do. And today it was so joyful and and expansive and it felt really good to take responsibility and to think about organization as as an act of self-care. So I'm really celebrating the fact that it's, it's such a nice place to be in my early mid thirties and, and actually like taking care of things and getting your house in order. So that's what I'm celebrating today. I love it. I'm very much of an organizational freak. I call myself. I just, I, I have this thing for organization. If you ask my husband, he's like, yeah, you do. (laughs) He's like, it might, it might be a little much, but even my kids, like my kids some days, they wake up every morning and they have this routine and every single day I still have to ask them, did you push your drawers in? Did you make your bed? Cause like this is a normal everyday thing, but yes, being organized, it just makes you feel so put together. It's something I explained to my husband too. Like he used to, he used to be so messy. Like I love him to pieces, but he was so messy. Like he would throw his underwear on the lamp guys. Like, I don't know why, like a lamp, why a lamp? And so and then he started cleaning and I told him like, when you come into the home and like, it's, it's nice and it's put together and you don't have to worry about the dishes or the pile of laundry that's downstairs. Mm-hmm. How does that make you feel? He's yeah. like, 
makes me feel like I can relax. So. Exactly. That, it's so true. And <laughs> my, my fiance said the exact same thing. It's that messy bed, messy head thing. And I think a lot of times we talk about like self-care and the notion of like the typical, you know, pedicure, bubble bath, you know, and, and really it's about what can I do today in this moment that would be an act of, of real love for the woman I'm becoming. And that to me is, is something we really need to focus on. Heck yeah, it is. And I think like <laughs> self-care is so, I, th- I feel like people get so overwhelmed with what self-care is supposed to look like mm-hmm. where it's just an individual's it's what you want. It's, it doesn't have to be complicated. If that means that you're going to sit on the couch and not do anything for 10 minutes and that's what makes you feel lit up, then all right, that's what it is. (laughs) You're basically (laughs) meditating. So (laughs) if I do nothing for 10 minutes and stare, that's we're, we're recalibrating. So we're good. (laughs) Yes. I just put it in a different term guys. Instead of staring, (laughs) we could use a different terminology, (laughs) but like, but it's true. I think people overcomplicate self-care and self-care is, just, it is what it is. It's what you yeah, need. totally. Um, and so today, guys, we're going to be talking, we're going to go a little bit deeper in regards to toxic relationships and really how this plays a toll on your mind, your body, your soul, and just you in an, in an all around being. And, you know, I personally have struggled with toxic relationships in my life. And I think, you know, we were just discussing this before we came on here about how so many women will sacrifice their self-care for love to feel like accepted and loved by someone. And so I just want to talk about that a little bit with you. Like what is your opinion in regards to why potentially a woman may do that or why, why we're we're more prone to just like giving up our self-care practice to feel this, this love by somebody else, like this validation. Mm, Yeah. Well, you hit the nail on the head with, with the term validation. I've, I've really seen a trend where, we have women enter these relationships and really just ignore their intuition because the payoff, right? We do things because we sort of get this payoff from it is the, the Facebook status, the plus one to the wedding, the, you know, you're not sitting at home, there's someone there. And so what's ended up happening is we have equated the literal other person in the room, whether they're good for us or not, as somehow better than being just us in a room. So I see a lot of people who are are in these relationships in the sense that, well, if I just love him more and harder, he'll suddenly have an epiphany, or it's better than being alone, or one thing I hear all the time, I don't wanna start over, or the whole even worse one, like no judgment, we've all been here, but I don't want someone else to get all the hard work I've put into this guy. Because if I've been struggling with this guy for years, he's going to get better, right? So I'm not going to give up now because if I do, someone else will get the better version. So when it comes to sort of when you see these amazing, beautiful, intelligent women in these kind of bullshit relationships, we need to start thinking like, well, there's, there's a reason for it. And it's not just women who are like, I have really low self-esteem and I don't feel worthy. That's a factor too. But there's also other things like what we just discussed, that sort of notion of like, well, it's better than nothing. I've put my time in, you know, he'll eventually get it. I'll just bide my time. So there's so many facets, but it's a huge thing that we're dealing with. Uh, Yes. And I just want to say another thing too, is that, or he used to be there. I remember, you know, there's someone that I have in my life and I know that they're currently going through this, this, this situation in their life. And they said, you know, he used to be good. Mm. There there used to be like these Mm. good sides of him. And, you know, he used to love with everything and he used to just have this, And so they're just waiting and they're sitting there waiting for like this, this, this person, this, this previous being of who they used to be with, Mm -hmm. they're waiting for that person to come back and they're not coming back. And there's so much, like I've had a few conversations recently with, with a few different women about relationships that they're in and that it's just not serving them, but they, they're not necessarily just their self-esteem, but like their self-worth, just who they are in total. They feel like if they're not in the relationship, that they're not good enough for, for the next person or that, that for some reason it is wrecking who they are as a person. Yeah. It's, it's, 
or even like, I know someone who is currently like, she's been married more than once. And she's like, I feel that I, if I, if I get divorced again for like the second or third time, that this defines who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't define who you are as a person. Like it doesn't, it's not just one person. It takes two to tango. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like you has to work together. That's something I've always said to my husband is if we're not working together, then the marriage isn't working because yeah. this, is a unit. this is a unit and we're together. And if one of us is falling down, then the other will too. And it's just like this, this ripple effect. And so ten yeah. one, ten no, one. but it's, it's, <laughs> it's true. And, and I think like, there's nothing more heartbreaking than hearing these stories because that is, is so common. There's a lot of what I like to call like the behind closed doors of, of relationship. And it's that sort of ambivalent, iffy, weird sort of space where we're like, all we're doing is thinking about our relationship. You know, when we have a good day, it's like, yes. Okay. Like, Oh, he's my person. And then when it's bullshit, we're like, oh my God, what am I doing? And so we spend all the time obsessing and stewing about the relationship instead of saying, okay, well, if I know that the best way to combat anxiety is through action, then then maybe we need to sort of literally do something to address the elephant in the room. And, And a lot of what I see when I work with couples is sort of that you know, should I stay? Should I go? And it really can wreck habit because then it becomes an identity thing. Nobody wants to have two failed marriages. No. Nobody wants to be that person. But oftentimes we think everybody is judging us, but they're not because they're too busy judging themselves. Yes. <laughs> like people oh aren't thinking about you. Right. Nobody cares. <laughs> they don't oh, care. Just just, just going to say it like that. And nobody cares. <laughs> they don't like all like real friends want you to be happy. Real yeah. friends want you to make healthy choices. I, I would rather see a girlfriend finally, you know, make a decision, whatever that is, than continue to have another year of the same and, and sort of just exhibit that energy of stress and intensity and, and anguish that's more painful right? Before you make that decision, once you make a decision, then you have an action plan, but it's that space before you sort of allow the truth to be told. That's when we get pain. Yeah. That's also when we, we can either allow fear to, to, you know, take over our decision-making or that, that action. Cause I know so many people are just, they sit in that, that state of fear or this mm-hmm. fear of unknown that if they don't do it, then nothing's going to change. If they mm-hmm. don't make that, then they're not going to get the answer that they, they don't want. Yeah. I've had so many conversations with people too, where they're, they're like, you know, I feel like I need to have this discussion with somebody because this is hurting me. This is making me feel this way, but I don't want them to say what I don't want to hear. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. Story, <laughs> story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, do you actually want to have the conversation then? Mm. Like, does this actually really bother you? Cause if it does, you as a woman or even a man, because, you know, this isn't no like black and white thing. This happens. Right. To, there's no prejudice when it comes to like relationship. Oh, crap. Yeah. Like it can happen to men and women. And so, and that was a huge thing. I'm totally going to go on another tangent here, but like my <laughs> husband, he, I love this man to death, but he was in a really toxic relationship before. And people used to always, I remember they're like, Oh, well, was it his fault? Mm. are you joking me like when yeah. when in the world did it happen that it was just a man's fault right. for a relationship to, to be closed or just simply a woman's fault it's not like like right. I said takes two to freaking tango sure. but like a woman can also be mentally abusive physically abusive and all these different oh, things yeah. it's not just a man the, like, the amount of men that have trauma from mistreatment from main female figures mothers, stepmothers, um, really, really rough women sort like there, there's no, I I'm really not about this, this notion of men versus women. We have to stop villainizing each other. Yep. It, it's so ironic that the, the main mission of, of this work is to bring us connected, bring us together. Vulnerability is amazing. Let's say how we feel. Let's just be who we are. We will never get to that if it's 
one versus the other. There yeah. are like men are passionate and sensitive and kind and loving and want monogamy. They want one woman. They want to have the whole thing. They really do. But when they live in a society where they're rewarded for, you know, banging hoes and growing up and they weren't taught how to cry, they weren't taught how to say, hey, I'm feeling something. That is a, it's, that's a lot to process. And then when men don't have a tribe of people, how on earth are they going to unload? So they will attract a lesson or they will attract someone who, who takes the best out of them or they attract someone like it's it's just the the pain and the energy doesn't go anywhere so if we're feeling this it needs to move so we will attract someone who will either take it out or reinforce it but it has to do something so yeah. we have to stop pinning each other against and say you know what there's a lot of people who have wounds and trauma mm -hmm. and and wouldn't it feel better if we just came together Right? Yeah. Like, that's why this work just lights me up. I feel like I just want to like hold hands with somebody and like, like sway back and forth and sing to it's my It's true. <laughs> it is. Like, honestly, it just, it would, we spend so much time denying the simple fact. So it would just be so much easier to just call it what it is. <laughs> yeah. Like call a spade a spade. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And even honestly, when we're talking about emotions and how like, how sometimes men are not necessarily emotionless, but don't necessarily cry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I grew up and my father didn't cry. I have maybe seen my father cry yeah. twice in my life. Mm -hmm. Like even when it came to, to, to the loss of like dear loved ones, I never saw him cry. And I always wondered why he never felt that he could show those emotions. And so I always grew up with a father who didn't. And I was always told that I was very emotional, that I cried mm. all the time. And and even my mom's the same. I was just talking to her yesterday and she was like, I just cry. I'm a crier. I'm like, I must've got it from you. Because <laughs> like, that's totally me. Like if someone does something that's, that's cute or funny, I'm like, oh my God, that was so cute. Oh my God, or yes. Like, or if I'm angry, I'm like, you hurt my feelings. So yes, bad. Like, I'm a crier too. Oh, <laughs> praise the criers. Because oh my gosh, I used to be judged so much for crying. But like my husband, he is so emotional. He I is love emotional. That. And me too. It was something that took me through a whole loop. The first time I ever saw him cry and I, I started crying because I'd never seen a man so like open about his emotions and so like grounded in the fact that he could be open like that, mm -hmm. where I just wanted to like wrap him in this like protective bubble and be like, everything's okay. And, yeah. but the fact that he can show them and that he can, he can be that person, but he can still be strong and mm -hmm. everything that, you know, this, this type A man we seem <laughs> to think of, like he is that plus because he's emotional and everything. Yeah. And so it's, I think emotions are so important. Like men aren't just these brick walls that you can just do. And no, do. It, they're not. They, feel. they, they do. And <laughs> it's like, my partner is very similar. Like he, you know, he, he's got some stuff as we all do. Um, and I love the fact that he's able to eventually he'll, he, he gets there. He doesn't come off the hop with it, but he goes through moments where it's like, okay, we can sense irritability and, and living with me as a relationship coach. It's just, I don't want to say it's funny to watch, but it's just, I like to, I like to observe. So he'll go through a period of irritability and I'm like, okay. And then he'll get a little barky and a little murk, like, eh, 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 everything's annoying. And I'm like, okay. And then maybe depending on the time, the mood, who's in the room, he might be an ass. And then I'm like, okay. And then it'll be welling up. And then it'll be, I'm really tired. I didn't get to sleep last night and I miss you and I'm hungry and, mm. and then then he's fine. And so I think provided that you're in a space where you can just sort of allow them to get there as they get there. Like, mm -hmm. I think it's so crucial to sort of encourage any sense of emotional mastery, awareness, because this is new for them. For us, we've been doing this since we were kids. When we were three, we had a doll and we would nurture the doll and we would kiss yeah. the doll and we would hold the doll. And, and we've all women biologically were wired this way. And so men, they're getting there. So I think if they had a supportive place to land, 
-hmm. it would be far easier and they would feel less judgment. And then eventually once this catches on that this would be easier, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that your relationships would be smoother, then it becomes a ripple effect and more people are like, hey, it's just so much easier if we just go through the emotional scale then recalibrate and get back to it rather than stew separately. I mean, that's my tangent. <laughs> Oh, that's okay. I'm so here for funny. it. I love that you went on one. Cause like, <laughs> yeah. I feel like some days I just go on like 5 million of them and I'm like, Hey guys, I'm over here. Like, Hey, <laughs> well, I mean, I just, it's funny because I, I just really <laughs> feel like one of the biggest issues in, in romantic love is that we have forgotten how to talk to each other. And that's how toxicity continues because when when two people are in a relationship and it's it's not good you know it's not good because you will start to turn inside you will mm -hmm. start to lose who you are and when you start to lose who you are that's a danger zone and what happens then is you don't have the cojones to kind of say wait a second my personal needs aren't being met holy shit, we need to sort of take it. We need to just zoom out and observe what's happening. We won't allow ourselves to do that if we have lost who we are. Mm -hmm. And when we lose who we are, it looks like codependency. It looks like staying in abusive relationships, making excuses for your partner. Oh, he didn't mean to. It's been a rough day. You can have a rough day once a month maybe i mean sure but if every other day oh he he didn't mean to it wasn't that bad you start to contort the situation yeah. and that's when you you kind of you're on a slippery slope and once that happens you won't feel like you have the space to communicate what's actually going on and that's when you get into the danger zone yeah and also I want to touch on, because you were talking about, <clears throat> you know, if someone keeps doing like, you know, X, Y, Z behavior mm -hmm. every second day, yeah. then there needs to be some accountability on their end for that. Mm -hmm. You can't keep covering their ass for mistakes that they make because they're just going to keep making it. If you make the excuses for them, they're not right. learning anything from that. Like if they're genuinely making a mistake. They need to learn from that mistake. Mm -hmm. Or like you said, it's just going to keep coming. It's like the universe loves to do that, where it's like, if you're not going to deal with the shit, I'm going to bring it back and I'm going to bring it back. I'm going to smack you in the face with it until yeah. you deal with it. The, like, two by, the two by four <laughs> moment. The, yes. the, the, the whoom, you get it now? <laughs> the neon sign, is it bright enough? Yes. And <clears throat> like, whatever anybody's beliefs are, like I truly believe in the universe and everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. And some days I sit here and I'm, I even said to Autumn today, I was like, you know what? Like, what is my lesson this week? Because this week has been a week and I'm like, there is something to learn. And I could have sat in frustration, but I'm literally just waiting for that pivotal moment where I'm like, ah, yeah. that is why <laughs> like there, there is a reason, but like, even in regards to like that danger zone, mm -hmm. my husband, when, when I first met him, like, you know, there was all these butterflies and that, that honeymoon stage where everything was just like, woo, which I don't think the honeymoon stage actually should end. Like. Me and my husband, we'd like to just keep that up, which is good, <laughs> but yeah. I don't think it has to just go away. <clears throat> but when I met his children who are beautiful, which are now my stepchildren, um, that also came with like another package too. Mm -hmm. And that there was another woman there and there was a lot of, you know, strenuous issues that they had gone through and things that I didn't know, but I basically placed myself in a danger zone. Like I placed myself in the middle of of a, a relationship that was not figured out, that was not, you know, talked through, gone through. It was toxic. It was, it was horrible. Like there is no other definition that I could, I will, I could put up many definitions, but <laughs> might not be very fucking appropriate. But like there, I placed myself in a spot that my, like my anxiety and who I felt as a woman was, was really tested. And like yeah. when I talk about how things happen for a reason, I was meant to know my husband. I was meant to marry this man and to help this man through whatever he had gone through previously, but also to know this woman mm -hmm. and the things that happened in their life and how a relationship can be that fucking bad. Yeah. And that's something I don't want in my life. Yeah. Like it, I just, I honestly like wish people sometimes could have like a television where they could like go inside your body and they could like <laughs> visually see the shit that's going on in your yeah. life to be like, Oh, oh no, I don't yeah. want that. Oh, 
oh, you did so good at standing up for yourself. Like it's, oh, see, tangent again. Tangent again. (laughs) It's what needs to come out. And and that's a thing. And and it's a a real dynamic. There's a lot of of stuff that comes with it, 100%. And for me personally, it's really about there's a right way to handle it. And that's with dignity and respect, keeping your side of the street clean and really making sure that the dialogue between the three of you, because that's what it's going to be because there's kids involved. It would be a far better way to sort of say, okay. And I know not everybody has the ability, not everyone. It's it could be a safety thing. Like I'm not saying this is a, a across the board, but if, if the three of you can sort of have a, a focus on, we may not like each other. Mm-hmm. I may not want to know your business. I don't want to be friends, but these kids are going to watch. Yes. And if we don't figure it out and be the parents, they're going to repeat the same story. Oh yeah. This is literally something that I was, I was having a discussion with my husband about this. And I, I told him, I said, ultimately, like, if this is for anybody who's in like, you know, a split relationship, co-parenting, co-parenting is a job and a half. It mm-hmm. is not always this walk in the park and it is, but it also is extremely rewarding when it comes to other children. But we and him had to have this big conversation where like, we cannot freaking control anything that happens over there. I mm-hmm. said, the only thing that we can control is the amount that we love our children in this home yeah. and make sure that they know that. Because I was saying this to actually, I was a friend of mine where I was saying, what would hap- what's happening now is, is so extremely important to them because this also dictates things that are going to happen to them in the future. Yep, like how they feel, their relationships, what they feel about love, you know, touch, like everything that is happening right now is going to shape them into the, the adult that they're going to be later. Right. And so I've told him, I said, as much as I wish we could control, like, everything that and anything that's going on with them and put them in this bubble that's not the case but we can control how much love and like responsibility and all these things that we give them here Mm -hmm. and it's and it took that because we almost felt like we needed like this validation for some reason that we had to be like these protectors on that side and it was driving us absolutely mental where I was like why are we looking for validation in any place? I said, all we can do is know that we have this safe and supportive home and to teach our children what love is. And they get to make that to figure out which, which one they're going to choose. They get yes. to like, so good. either way, I like, honestly, I said to Chris before, like Chris is my husband. I said, you know, I can try my hardest to like, if my kids are doing something that pisses me off so much, they know it. Cause this mama gets mad. If you're doing something I don't like you doing, you'll know it. <laughs> However, I can't always control. They're going to do shit that I don't want them to yeah. do. But ultimately, like we've told them, you make a choice. There is like every action you make has a reaction, whether that's yeah. positive or negative. Every action you make affects tons of other people in this planet. And you need to be accountable and responsible for that. And so yeah. instead, like that was probably the biggest pivotal moment we had with our kids when I said like, no. I'm not just responsible for all their fucking decisions. Like they need to be like, they need to own this. And so, and my kids reacted to it so well. They were like, Whoa, like do this, like this could affect other people or like, you mean mean I have a choice? Like I could choose not to do this. Well, of course you have a fucking choice. Oh, that's so, I love to hear that because that's so, that's so refreshing. And I really think that it's like our kids' kids will be the generation that we're working on now because yes. so much of my work and so much of the stuff that I deal with clients, it's all about the childhood in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Because if I were to ask you, what do you believe to be true about love? There's usually an instant picture and that usually comes from what was modeled. Yep. Or what wasn't modeled. If you grew up in a household that wasn't great, you can either say love is bullshit or you can become incredibly needy and, and crave it and take it from anybody, right? So yeah. our job is to form and shape human beings who are going to do better than we did. So I love that. That's amazing. Yeah. And even as parents, I think it's important to know like when you're, when you're loving your kids and even when you're loving yourself, like you were saying, like if your kids are watching you, no matter what, they're watching what you're doing, whether that means you're sitting there eating a bowl of soup. Like, I'm not kidding because my one and a half year old literally mimics how I clean the damn house. 
Like she goes and takes her little cleaning stuff and she follows me around like, fuck, I need to vacuum like my mom. I'm like, you're a year and a half, but they watch. Like I'm like stuttering because I'm like, Bo does the same thing. He will, he will repeat stuff and he'll want to follow me around and, and all these things. And, you know, it's so fascinating and sort of the downside of this conscious parenting situation is it's the fact that it's almost too much for me. Like everything I'm like, is this going to be an imprint? Is this going to be a memory? Yeah. Like when Jordan goes to work, uh, the, we live in, in a bungalow that has windows all around. So Jordan will go down the stairs and Bo will run to the window and watch Jordan, like watch daddy go down the stairs and he'll like bang on the window and wave. And Jordan always like, looks up and waves <laughs> and there was one that one time where I guess he didn't hear him or he didn't forget or he didn't look back and Bo is just knocking at the door and Jordan just drives off and I'm like that's it right there that's the trauma oh my god it'll be like that one time my dad didn't wave by to me and you know it's like we we know I notice everything it's like I, I, I remember telling Bo at five months old, like, you're an amazing soul. Like, thank you for joining us. You're perfect in every way. And it's because it's just, I know what it's like to be, you know, 20, 30 something. And really when you do in inner work, when you do personal development work, when you look at your relationships, when you look at your patterns, it's usually quite uncomfortable and it usually comes from good old mom and dad, bless their hearts. Like they just didn't yes. know. Yes. <laughs> it's a different time. <laughs> well, and I think it's important that like, we're going to make mistakes. Like yeah. I can try and watch every single thing that I'm doing in my life. And even for my kids or for my relationship with my husband, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to make mistakes. Right. It doesn't mean that we're not going to communicate. Like, honestly, there was one thing that I learned and it was a big conversation I ended up having with my father because my father used to, used to get very angry very quickly. It was just this like control thing that he, that he did. And so there was a lot of yelling in my home when I was a child. My father had a whole lot of fucking love though. So when people are listening to this, I don't want them to be like, oh, her dad was me. No, my dad was filled yeah. with a lot of fucking love, but there was also a lot of yelling. So like, if, the, if you literally like did one thing, you were just like, oh God, my dad's going to know and I'm going to get weaned out. And so that is something that's a behavior that I'm, that I learned. Yeah. And I ended up like when I, when I ended up meeting my husband and I had stepchildren, I didn't know how to fucking parent. I yeah. thought I was brilliant. I was like, I got this. I got the shit. Like <laughs> I, it's a cakewalk. No. And so this need for control that I didn't have with children who have these own little wild, you know, imaginations of their mm -hmm. own. I started yelling and I started, mm -hmm. and I remember my dad one day, he pulled me aside and he's like, I might've done something when you were younger that, that taught you this. And oh, this wow. is not going to serve you. Like, this is not going to do what you want it to do. And it was a big moment to sit there with my dad to, and for him to say that because you could see that he was hurt, that wow. he, that he saw that I carried that on, that I, that I decided that that was how I could deal with it. And it's still something that I have to deal with sometimes. I still sometimes yell at my kids and my husband's like, okay, I think that was a little much. And after I, I apologized to them. Mm -hmm. I remember my stepson said like, you know, I don't like it when you yell. And, and I remember I cried with him because I said, I don't like it either. I said, there's, there's things and we make mistakes as parents and we make mistakes as adults. And there's things that we've learned. And it's just like a, like a habit. It's a habit that you have to come out of. And so you're going to make mistakes. Like, fuck, I've made plenty of mistakes yeah. as a parent. And one thing I know that my kids are probably going to mention when they get older is that they watched me go from like maybe being this, being angry or like frustrated that I couldn't control this to understanding mm -hmm. to like opening up that they're they have a choice and they can do things and that that anger wasn't always there. But unless honestly, unless my dad had this big pivotal conversation with me, probably wouldn't have been something I would have noticed for a long fucking time. Like yeah, that's amazing. because that was huge. Totally, it, it was huge. And even like with our kids, we teach them like how they can, they have this reset button. It's like this imaginary button on their forehead where if they're having this like horrible day or they wake up in the morning and they're just like, I hate the world. Life sucks. I'm like, you see this button on your forehead? Just push it. I said, push it. I was like, it makes them giggle. It makes them laugh. Oh, and it cute. turns their day into like this positive day. I love that. Joke amazing. Yeah. We'll joke with them and we'll be like, are you having a bad day? 
because mm-hmm. they think you need to push your button. <laughs> I'm like, Aww. you have a choice. Like you could push it. Like you could have a better day. <laughs> and then they do. And then they change the course of their own day just simply about taking an action. Like relationships, like you said, you can work together mm-hmm. or you can work like polar opposites. And like working with my kids and listening to my kids and listening to my husband has 1000% amplified our relationships like yeah you're gonna have to do work anyway you might as well do (laughs) the fun stuff that's gonna bring you together (laughs) right (laughs) like and my kids it's there's there's so many other factors to why I get angry about things like I'm not perfect it's probably the one thing that I've talked to like my husband and you know that I don't like that I get angry quickly it's something I'm learning but Mm -hmm. if you also take like the first step is being accountable for your actions and like knowing, like knowing that that's a problem. You're like, okay, that doesn't serve me anymore. Now, how can I stop that? That doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. Like anybody who has a relationship issue, I've known so many people, like there's honestly a good friend of mine was in a relationship and all they did was scream at each other before until they finally were open and was like, this is not helping us. We need to try to stop. That didn't mean that they stopped yelling at each other right away, but they were aware of it and that made it stop they became more aware and more aware and then started talking to each other instead of screaming at one another. Like yeah. it just takes talking. See tangent, tangent number four, I think this is. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I just, you know, kids love everything, but like, you know, we're going to go back <laughs> to where we were talking about like, you know, toxic relationships. Mm-hmm. What is, like for anybody who's listening, whether it's parents, whether you're single, whether you're in a relationship, like if there's something you could tell women who are struggling with a toxic relationship, like something you just wished every fucking woman would know, like, what would that be? If I had to say one thing, well, you know what? I I feel like I should preface this. I'm going to preface and then say my one thing. I'm going to break the rules. (laughs) Relationships are complex. Not one relationship is like this good versus bad thing. When I talk about toxic relationships, it's, it's more about the, if, if your daughter was coming to you with this and you have a body response of like, oh my gosh, that's, that's, whew, that's intense. We know, we know what a bad patch is in a relationship. And we also know what a, that couple who is fighting and bickering and it's not good for them. So mm-hmm. I just, I, I want to make it clear because I know some people can get a little bit um, fearful that I'm, I'm saying relationships have to be amazing and perfect all the time because they, they do not. My partner and I, like we have mountains of stuff. Like it's, it's not sunshine and roses and sex oh. five times a day. And like, that's not the case. So I, I will say that the thing that you really need, and for anyone listening, is is you really need to be, make friends with honesty. Mm-hmm. You have got to really allow yourself to be honest because denial is delicious. It's so, so easy to just, you know, make things out to be okay or, you know, look for evidence to support that you're not crazy or whatever the case may be. And it's like, I really think that the the biggest thing you need to do is really say, am I willing to be honest about this? It doesn't mean you need to make a decision. It doesn't mean if you say, yes, I'm willing to be honest that your relationship is over because when, especially like when couples come to work with me, there are certain like diagnostic questions that we kind of ask to see if it's in your best interest to stay or if it's in your best interest to leave, but we can't even begin the process if you're not being honest about the fact that I think I might be in a shitty relationship and I'm terrified to even say that. If you can just think about saying that, try to say it, that's when you can start exploring. And if you make it more of a curiosity as opposed to like a for sure this is the answer, then you'll be able to, to find more, more excitement and more play. Like there are certain key factors that are, in my opinion, real warning signs. And then there are life moments that may just require a tune-up, but we won't be able to really know unless we say, okay, I don't feel really good in this. 
there's something iffy. The body knows. Women are so intuitive. When I was in my abusive relationship, I was drinking a liter and a half of wine a day. That's probably not a good sign. I was eating junk food. I was doing anything to sort of stuff my feelings because I wasn't in a space where I could be heard. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really about find your voice and just say, you can even start by saying, am I willing to be honest with myself about my relationship today? And it might be no, and that's okay. Cause you, you started, but as yep. soon as we can just call a thing, a thing, then you can do the work. Yeah. I love that. Honesty is huge. It is. <laughs> It is like a huge value that I have is honesty, like honesty and integrity are just two major things. And I feel like honesty, you know, integrity really falls with honesty there. <laughs> I feel like you need to be honest to be in integrity. And 100%. as like, I don't know, there's just so much about the, even as a woman, here's where I was going with that. So <laughs> we were talking about like our utilizing our voice mm -hmm. as a woman like especially as a woman like if you really dive deeper into like your chakra system yeah. like your vocal like your voice and your like womb chakra like they are very closely connected like so the way that you receive pleasure is also a way like a woman's voice is I, i've read it i honestly i took something on this and i was blown the fuck away about mm -hmm. how like how a woman can receive sexual pleasure can also really amplify our voice. Mm. How we're receiving pleasure in the bedroom, our voice can become extremely loud. It's like, there's no cutoff. It's like we, which is incredible. Like, yeah. Amen. Let's all have good sex and great yes. life. <laughs> like, yes. But Seriously. it's, but it's so important to get to know your body and to know that like utilizing your voice mm -hmm. is so powerful, not just for you, but to so many other people. Like, that's exactly why I created this podcast to be able to have conversations with women who have very strong points of views mm -hmm. that are polarizing, that talk about the stuff that not everybody talks about because we live in a society that tries to get us to like push everything down and to suppress everything. Yeah. Why? Like alcohol, drugs, all, all like, it just blows my mind. Honestly, yeah. I to a point in my life where like I never had, um, I didn't have, like an addiction to like alcohol, but I smoked and I was, and I was doing drugs before. And, you know, I was, I was just numbing myself. Yep. That's all that, I was doing. Well, and I mean, honestly, it's like, I, I think to myself, a lot of what's going on in the, in, in the relationship world and like why things are sort of in this weird space is because we're all, <laughs> excuse me, we're all just really trying to figure out who we actually are. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you think about the notion of relationship dynamic, it's essentially you will, you will always sort of attract who you are, right? So if you are in a space where you are putting on a front or saying, oh, I don't want anything serious. I'm going to focus on my fill in the blank. If whatever we're pretending, we'll typically call in someone who's doing the same thing. Yep. Or if we are very um, emotionally open to the point where we've lost discernment, we'll call in people who are like, sweet, I can, I can, I can take this woman for what she's got. Like, so we need to really be mindful about what is, what, who is, who am I actually? What am I bringing to the table? Would I date me? Would I want to marry me? Could I spend 60 years of me? And I think for a long time when I was single, I, I had a really easy time with being by myself. I'm an only child. I love alone time. But whenever I would feel the slightest tinge of loneliness, anxiety, if, if I had no money, I would go and get a date. I would literally go on, on back in the day, it was plenty of fish. It was that you pull up the laptop and log in to your profile. There were no apps. <laughs> and I would literally date for food. I would rack up as many days as possible. And it was, it was a drug. I want to feel validated. I want to feel sexy. I want to feel funny. I want to like, cool, free, free food and drinks five nights a week, no problem. And it was absolutely soul crushing because it was a complete front. It was a facade and the pain and damage of being like, why doesn't anyone pick me? Why, why is no one picked me? 
-hmm. I'll never forget it. And it was like, well, Steph, because you're acting crazy, you're being ridiculous. And I, and I don't mean to use the term crazy in that, that type of derogatory way, but I was literally insane. Like the behavior was insanity. I was expecting to be the same person, do the same thing. I would wear the same, like I had a, I had a dress. It was a blue dress. Jordan made me throw it out when we were Marie Kondoing our closet. He's like, I don't need to see your sex dress from back when you were dating, but I would wear it every first date, I would tell the same story, I would look the same, and I would just assume that one of these guys would pick me. One of them's gonna, it's gotta work, dating's a numbers game, right? Such a farce. I just kept attracting bigger versions of the last guy who hurt me, yep. until I was like, wait a second, maybe, just maybe, the problem's me. <laughs> yeah, maybe, just maybe. <laughs> I got some shit. Yeah. I got some, I got some daddy issues. I got some worth stuff. I'm sleeping with guys three hours after I meet them. I'm drinking wine every day. Am I a wifey material? I don't know. Not right now. Not right now. So I would attract guys who were into just doing the same thing, into hanging out, kicking it, Next whatever. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm, I'm bordering on 29 and I'm like, oh my God, like what the hell? And so that's when everything changed. And this is my, what, tangent number three now? We should just call <laughs> this episode tangents. <laughs> yes. Evening, Thursday tangents. But that was the biggest thing. I was genuinely baffled at how I, little miss, I think I'm so great. How am I still single? I don't, I don't understand. And it was you say you want a husband, a house, business, self-respect, all that shit. That's what you want, right? You keep saying it, but you're over here behaving like a bar star. Yep. So unless and until the honesty comes up where it's like, this is what I'm doing. No wonder. I'm not surprised. I don't blame anybody but myself. And I think that the guys I dated in the toxic relationships I was in in that phase were a direct representation of how I felt about myself. It's not to say that my abuser or anyone who hurt me, like, it's not to say that, oh, it's fine. I, I was, that's what I was getting. It was the fact that I didn't have the ability to assess my choices. Like I didn't, I didn't stop and say, hey, maybe that 35 year old who doesn't have a job, a phone or a car might have some baggage. Mm -hmm. It was like, Oh, he's been through our times. Oh, his ex-wife, you know, took him for everything he's got. Oh, that DUI wasn't so bad. And now I think to myself, I would have, I would have bolted. I would have been like, not my monkey, not my circus, no judgment, but that's not my problem. Yep. And now it would be pivoting to healthy, you know, quest for excellence, personal development, wanting the calm, kind, no more chaos, no more drama. But the only way that you can sort of pivot that is when you start to look inward and say, what about me is a drama magnet? Mm -hmm. What about me is, is attracting the, the emotionally unavailable guys the fixer uppers, the wounded sad guys, like if that's your pattern, the common denominator is you, yep. right? So that's in a nutshell, honesty, honesty will save your life. <laughs> Rigorous honesty. <laughs> yes, it will. And honestly, I'm sitting here and I'm listening to you. And before I met my husband, I asked myself the same questions. Like, why am I meeting the same men? why does nobody want to be with me? Why it was this, why me, why me, why me? Why is nobody treating me with respect? Why is nobody, you know, calling me back? And I, I remember like my husband had saved himself till marriage. And when I met him, I just like my heart sank to my stomach, not because he did that because I was so proud of him for doing that and having that self-respect for himself. But like, I gave myself away so freely and not caring because I thought it was going to give me something. Mm -hmm. And I remember we were driving and he asked me the question. He said, well, how many people have you slept with? 
And I said, unless you are really wanting to sit here and have this discussion, I said, I will tell you, and I will be a thousand percent honest with you. I said, but if you, if you're not open to hear it, don't ask me the question. Mm. And he was triggered by that. And he was upset. And I said, you know, there's situations in my life that I'm not proud of. I said, there's, there's people that I've had in my life that I'm not proud of. Mm -hmm. I said, but at that time, that's what I was attracting into my life like over and over and over again. And it wasn't until I started going to the gym, eating healthier, you know, I decided to change careers and get out of a toxic career that I was Mm -hmm. in is when I actually met my husband. And I had been like me and him lived in the same city. Like, and then I moved (laughs) to like, you know, lovely little Regina, Saskatchewan, only 45 minutes away from where I live now. (laughs) And all of a sudden I met him. Then we went to the same gym. He was a trainer in that gym. I was around him all the time. I was just not there and open enough to be with him yet. Boom. Like hundred percent. That's how it is. That's how it goes. Like that's actually (laughs) when people are like, what's going on? Like, where is he? I mean, it's, it's like, he's there. Yeah. The universe is literally like the way that I see it is it's like one big chess game in whatever realm we got going on. And it's like, you're over here and you're like, I want to make a move. I want to, this is stupid. I I want, I want a real relationship. So you kind of, you move a little bit and the universe goes, cool. We have this perfect person for you. We're going to move him a little bit over there too. He's got some stuff to do. You've got some stuff to do, but just stay on the path and we'll, we'll get you, we'll get you there. And so what the human does is we fuck it up. Well, you know, I need to pretend that I'm into all the shit he's into. So he'll like me. The universe moves you back. Nope. Mm-hmm. You need to learn a lesson in identity. Yeah. But where is he? Where is he? I'm, I'm ready for a real relationship. Okay. The universe goes, we'll move you a little bit closer. And then the next lesson and then the next lesson. So that's my sort of analogy on timeline. Like two people, boom, 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 boom dropped in when it's the right exact time based on the learning that both need to do in order to be the right match for each other. Yeah. So chill. Like, <laughs> like yeah, right. Like literally, relax. honestly, my husband was, he had just gone through his separation. I was just leaving like a job. I ended up moving. We ended up meeting each other at the right time. I didn't even pay attention to his existence. And if he listened to this, he'd probably be like, excuse me. I didn't even know that he was there. Yeah. Like, and so the person that you're supposed to be with, you might have fucking crossed paths with this person already and you don't even know. Like, or it's not someone you expect. Like my partner, yes. <laughs> I remember when I was single and I would write out the lists, like throw your <laughs> list away. It's not about a list. It's about an embodiment of energy that you share. Yes. Um, Cause anyone can be tall with a good job, right? Like so I remember thinking like my guy was going to be older, like salt and pepper hair. He'd work on Bay Street and we would, we would live in this, in this loft with exposed brick and we would drink gin martinis and, and, and banter. Like I actually thought that's what my person was because at the time, that's what I was like. I was going to be a writer. I was living in downtown Toronto and my partner, my, the universe was like, actually, Stephanie, you don't need another talker because you talk, you need a listener. You don't need someone older. You need someone that will help you become who you are. Like mm-hmm. screw what we think. And so my partner is eight years younger than me. Um, I did not get the Diane Keaton mother-in-law that I always wanted. The mother-in-law I got does not enjoy me at all. We do not have a relationship. Um, I, the things that I, I, I didn't expect came in and it was perfect because that was a beautiful lesson that I needed to move forward. He was able to give to me things I didn't have. I was able to show him the way it it all fit in this like perfect synchronistic puzzle piece. But I can tell you, had I met him five years ago, I probably would have blown him off. No pun intended. I li- quite literally said, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> no way. And now it's like, holy shit, you're an amazing magical person who knows me forwards, backwards, side to side. Like it's, it's a vibe. Yep. He kn- we can read each other's 
Like he can look at me and say, what, what are you thinking about? Are you stressed about that thing? And you can't write that down on a piece of paper. That's no. just, if you allow yourself to be fully you, learning who you actually are so that you can shine yourself out to the universe and say, I'm willing to work on my shit, but can we, can we move him along a little bit? But I'm going to be patient. We don't need another patience lesson. I've already <laughs> learned that one. Yes. I'm good with the patience lesson. No more. And then you, you, you go to that random party. You decide to go to that different Starbucks. A, a coworker's brother comes to the lunch. There, there's always stuff. Your situation, the trainer at the gym that you passed by. Like, that's the fun and the magic. And we stop. We don't expect that anymore. We just think we just need, like, great sex tips and, you know, lips and all that garbage like it doesn't matter it's the it's who you are (laughs) it is 100 percent. I remember you know I'm not I've always been like heavier I've always been a little bit of a heavier woman and so and I remember I was so down on myself about this before and my husband looked at me and he said I wish that you could see you the way that I see you because what I see is like this beautiful this nurturing this caring this incredible woman and this woman who, who wears like many, many hats that cares about people. Yeah. And he's like, I don't see what you see when you look in the mirror. Like when you, when you say, oh, I have this goal. Like it's, mm-hmm. so now it's something that I focused on because like with my stepdaughter, bless her little soul. I have to say a fun story. <laughs> okay. So she came. <laughs> oh my God. So she's eight. And I don't know who told her this, this at school, but somebody bless their heart because Somebody must have been teasing her about like roles or something. And so like when she bent over, she like, she, the one day she came to me and she was like, Kara, I have roles. And I'm like, well, you're bending over. Like I have them too. Like everybody does. (laughs) And so then she came in the door the one day and she was like, Kara, I have abs. And she like rolls her, her tummy over and like, look at all these abs. And I was like, yeah, you go girl. She looks at me. She's like, you you have a lot of abs. That's <laughs> like, amazing. Oh my gosh. That's hilarious. I was like, you know what? I love you, kid. And I know that you meant that the nicest way, but like they're rolls, not abs. <laughs> out, out the mouth, babe. Oh my God. <laughs> and she was so like, she was just so happy about it. So like, I don't know. Love, love is not what we all like picture. It's not this like quote unquote, what it's supposed to be. And like, I, it's just so important. Like you said, to just like things match up the when they're supposed to like yeah. it's, we always get so caught up in the how yes like, how is something going to happen when like yeah. how or when like how or when are the biggest things and i i you know i always say to my clients that like the for the ones preparing for relationship i'm like the space this cosmic time like how instead of being like oh my god i'm single and miserable and lonely what if I, what if I were to tell you that like, okay, well, what if you were single and lonely and miserable by choice? And like, in like seven months, you're going to decide that you want to go for a walk in this park and you're going to walk by and then you're going to get hungry. And then you're going to want to go and get Thai food. And you're going to sit at the bar because you don't want to be by yourself uh, at lunch because you're single and lonely. And then the guy that's serving you lunch is off in 20 minutes and he wants to sit next to you and eat lunch. Like, what if you could just play with, with that thought instead of ruminating about it's never going to happen. What's going on? That is just going to call in another, another length of time. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, wouldn't it feel better to just be like, or I have this weird funky time that I can get to like be obsessed with myself and enjoy myself and prepare my apartment and do all the things that I want to do. And, and I know that this person is going to enter precisely when it's supposed to, wouldn't that just take the heat out? It feels better to me. Like, (laughs) and believe me, I was single and, and actively like, you know, one month to two year, all over the place, crazy, crazy, crazy. So I know what it's like. 
I mean, a lot of times people think like, well, you know, you have a baby, you're engaged, like you're done now, you're good, you don't get it. I haven't heard that in a while, but I remember in the beginning hearing that a lot being like, my partner could at, at any moment, at any moment, either decide, not for me anymore, um, could leave this planet, uh, something crazy could happen. There's, the, you're never done, right? Like, and so, and, and then the learning morphs into how do him and I be a couple, parents and individuals? That's a whole other learning. So no one's done, no one's finished. It's just different things to figure out. And it would be, it's so much easier to do that when you can really focus on the play and the magic and what's around the corner. Like if you could believe that the best thing in your life is about to happen, I, I don't think you'd be up at night stressing out so much. <laughs> no, no. You wouldn't be. You'd be like, life's good. Life's set. Yeah, I'm chilling. It's good. We're fine. <laughs> yeah. Relax, everyone. Honestly, okay, I can't wait to like listen back to this conversation. <laughs> I think that's like my favorite part is after I have these conversations with, I, I like tune back and I listen in and I laugh hysterically at certain things that you said. <laughs> oh, like the tangents would be like, we should call this tangents. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to say, honestly, thank you because I can talk to you forever and I love that like when I when I ask people to come on the podcast that I'm able to talk to them forever mm -hmm. like if I if I can come on here and just have this easy conversation with you about life like a real life shit yeah I those are my kind of people like yes. those are the people I jive with I'm like you're, yes. you're my people you're <laughs> <Yes>. my people <laughs> <laughs> yes because I like you were saying earlier you're like you know I talk a lot and so you know I do too like and my husband doesn't, he's very, he's quiet and he yeah. doesn't. Isn't that nice? Isn't it nice? We yes. think we're like, oh, I want someone. We're just going to be like, bah, 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 bah. you know what? You don't want someone just like you. You would get so <laughs> mad. It's too much. Like if I dated a guy version of me, it would be a pissing contest. Oh yes. It would be constant. I can't, it would drive me crazy. So you don't like you don't <laughs> another you you need someone that you could learn from and inspire like that's that's the juice yes it is and so i just want to say honestly thank you so much for coming on the podcast and having this conversation because i know that this conversation is going to empower a lot of other women and some women that are going to listen to it and be like oh she just punched me in the throat with some truth <laughs> but like as a yeah, sure did, but that's my that I have to because it's everything is said with massive love and it's because yeah. you can either hear a little bit of a stinger and propel into your next level or you can live another 10 years of the same and yeah. I would much rather see you thrive and shine so thank you for asking me I had a blast yeah it was so for if people want to connect with you further can you let us know how they can find you Yes, definitely. So if you enjoyed this and you want to connect more, I'm searchable on all social medias. So you can find me on Instagram at goodloveco. I'm on Twitter at goodloveco and searchable Stephanie Terma on all SEO search engines. And you can just send me a message and we can connect. And I'll make sure that I have these in the show notes as well. So if anybody is looking for that, then it'll all be on there and it's tagged and you can just click on it and I'll take you to Stephanie as well. So thank you again so, so much for coming on the podcast. It was so much fun. And for everybody else, I will see you guys all in the next episode. Bye. Bye.